I'm J.G. Michael, and this is Parallax Views. Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and in a few moments you're going to listen to another segment of Parallax Views. But before you do that, let me tell you about my new book, Why the Vietnam War. It's a sequel to my previous book called The War State, which has lots of positive reviews and Amazon's been out for years. But this one is a more detailed case study of how American empire and national security state operate using Vietnam. And I believe it shows also how things work today, how policy is actually made and why. So grab the book on Amazon.com, Why the Vietnam War. Hey there, Parallax Views listeners. On this edition of the program, we're going to be speaking to an interesting and controversial thinker, John Zerzon, author of the new book, When We Are Human, Notes from the Age of Pandemics. Now, if you're unfamiliar with John Zerzon, he has been described as a radical anarcho-primitivist thinker who critiques industrial and agricultural civilization, which he argues has led us into a sea of neuroses and alienation. The domesticating hand of civilization itself, he argues, is at the very root of our social woes. It's a pretty radical concept, and I don't necessarily agree or disagree with Zerzon's points, but I did want to give him a chance to help listeners that may be new to his thought understand what he is getting at. I find him to be a rather interesting uh, thinker and philosopher, although I'm not sure he would like the term philosopher, as you'll see in our conversation to follow. And before we get to that conversation, I'd like to thank Feral House, the publisher of When We Are Human, Notes from the Age of Pandemics, for helping get John Zerzon on the program. And with that being said, let's get right to it with the radical thinker of anarcho-primitivism, John Zerzon. Hey there, Parallax Views listeners. Before we continue our conversation on this edition of Parallax Views, I want to notify California listeners of the program about one of our sponsors, the Therapy Practice of Alexander Yu. Yu is an experienced teletherapist since 2008, and he goes by the motto, Flow, Adapt, Change, as Lao Tzu would say. And he wants to accompany you on your journey of self-improvement. Now, again, this applies to California listeners of the program. Alexander is a licensed psychotherapist and teletherapist. And if you'd like his services, then please contact him at Alexander U. That's Alexander U Y O O dot com. And he can be reached by email at therapy at alexanderu.com or by phone at 323-834-9828. That's 323-834-9828. This is only available once again to my California listeners. But if you need anything related to therapy needs, please be sure to contact our sponsor, Alexander Yu. Welcome to Parallax Views. John Zerson, I would say a, a philosopher often described as an anarcho-primitivist. I'm not a big fan of you know, labels, but uh, you've been referred to as an anarcho-primitivist, and you have a new book out called When We Are Human, Notes from the Age of Pandemics. How are you doing today, John? Doing fine, thanks. It's hot up here, but uh, that's it's a hot summer. <laughs> it's only going to get hotter from here, I hear. Uh, that's yeah, one of the crises yeah. we're facing. <laughs> yeah. So 
I guess where I wanted to start is that I think when people have talked about your work, uh, a lot of people will point towards you as a critic of uh, technology and of civilization. But I think at the heart of your work, there's something even more going on. I think that you uh, are someone who's primarily concerned with liberation. Uh, a total liberation from domination. And you see that domination is not just starting with uh, industrial civilization, but going back further to what uh, a fellow thinker uh, that I believe you've been friendly with in the past, Kevin Tucker, has referred to as the agrarian curse. What is that sort of agrarian curse or the problem of agrarian civilization? Well, he's talking about domestication, and that was such a an epical turning point. The The, the move away from taking what nature gives to dominating nature, farming. It's, it's really, that was, uh, for so long, we lived uh, a freer life and, uh, you know, hunter-gatherer life. And all of that changed very rapidly when, when, with the onset of uh, agriculture. I think that's a good term, agrarian uh, curse. And you see it in various cultures. It's, it's there, the fall, whatever you want to call it. It's, it was certainly noticed by various people uh, from then on. So when we talk about uh, the sort of pre-agrarian world, uh, what would you say, why are you so, I guess, supportive of going back to something like that? Or what, what do you see as the positives that people maybe don't think about? Because I think a lot of people haven't had time to think out all these issues, or maybe they haven't even considered them. Well, you know, part of it is simply, it's really getting bad. It's this civilization is just uh, showing itself on all fronts from the social uh, or psyche uh, level to the absolute, uh, really obliteration of the natural world of the biosphere. I mean, it's, it's going down the toilet fast. So that causes people, I think, to maybe be open to questioning the whole deal. Why do civilizations all fail? And why is this one failing? which is the only one left, I think, really. Uh, and, you know, also, I think I've come to this point of view somewhat in recent years, what we might call the spiritual level of all this. Like you bring up uh, what is behind all this? What is the goal? Why erase everything in favor of what? And I think you could start on that level, you know, in terms of immediacy, um, intimacy with the earth, wholeness. These these could be called spiritual values. I would call them spiritual values, but at base very political too. That's that's what is wanted. And what would you have to remove to get there? To have, well, to have for one thing, community. Everybody wants community, right? And I think that means face-to-face -face, uh, life. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's not community. It's, mass society has erased community. So Well, we now live in sort of... Uh... Kevin has also coined this term. I have to thank him for that. But it's like we live in a network of digital alienation at this point. We're totally isolated. Uh, we're estranged from each other. And we, we, the level of social stratification is just growing and it keeps growing. Oh, definitely. It's just remarkable. All these things that we were sort of thinking about or projecting, it's so scary because here it is. I mean, it's, it's just all of those things in this supposedly rich, prosperous place, relatively speaking, the, the levels of immiseration are just fabulous. I mean, they're just, you know, the loneliness, the depression, the deaths of despair, speaking of the opioid crisis, and on and on and on, the suicides is among the youth, for example. I mean, just endless list of alienation. It's just, it, I mean, you know, if things were going relatively well in some kind of healthy direction, we wouldn't be talking about this. We wouldn't need to. But obviously, it's just the opposite. For for my listeners, you just said all of these things, these sort of this depression, this alienation, war, conflict, strife. Why do you see it as being all connected to civilization itself? And maybe you can give more of a definition of uh, what you mean by civilization. I think at one point you've summed it up as a civilization is a parasite that consumes its host. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one way to get to the heart of it. And it is the logic of domestication, control. That was the move to control. So Always we, we, more control. 
I didn't want to interrupt you, but I meant when we say domestication and control and domination, we're talking about it starts with uh, we start taking over this land, then we dominate the livestock, and then eventually we're dominating human beings. It starts there. You know, we don't, we're not mobile, we're sedentary, storage starts there. So then you've got to have some, some way of uh, doling that out or coordinating it. Where with hunter gatherer, I mean, the sort of the model. People are, didn't have a lot of stuff to drag around. They they moved they moved somewhat. Not they were not always on the move, nomadically uh, speaking. But uh, it was a totally different. Everything changed with with agriculture just nine ten thousand years ago. Whereas we lived for a million years with all kinds of capacities. We were we had control of fire over a million years ago. You know, without strife, without hierarchy, without uh, without ruining nature. I mean, you can. It's rather easy to see. And the people that are saying, oh, we need more of this, or oh, we're going to perfect this, or just a little more technology, the record just flies in the face of that just in such a stark way that uh, that's just preposterous to to cling to that. I, I just, I marvel at how people uh, can still have some kind of grain of faith in in the future of civilization. This is not I'm there. assuming you've had a, a few debates at times with a people calling themselves transhumanists or uh, singulitarians, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I had one at Stanford a couple of years ago. Was, this guy was all the way technology. It's, it was the religion. In fact, transhumanism is, you know, it may sound kind of nutty, but it, it's the logic of the system. That's where we're going. And I would also say, by the way, primitivism is the logic of the answer to that. Maybe they both seem like fringe deals, but it, not that fringe. I mean, if you look at what's at the heart of, of the different choices, uh, there you get the, these different alternatives. And you, I think you would argue there isn't uh, a middle ground where these two things um, can coexist. I mean, the, I, I think transhumanists would say, well, well, we'll let these people, if they want to be primitive, they can be primitive. But it, it seems like civilization sort of forces people in. Uh, you don't have a choice, really. At least from your perspective, yeah, it's my I think understanding. That's right. It's it's very totalizing. The force field of it. There's there's no lifeboat where you can go and just paddle away or something. That's that's not that's not the nature of it. And it's less so every day. I mean, it is a more globally integrated system in every way, and uh, in in not just the economics of it or the nuts and bolts of it, but culturally and every other way. And now. We're in the age of pandemics, one after another. There's, this is not going to be the end of it. We, you know, we've gone from kind of nonstop epidemics, SARS, West Nile, Zika, Ebola, blah, blah, blah. Now they're morphing together. And that's another just, you know, scary deal. It's, that's, uh, that's where we're at on that level, right? So I, mean, I, I just wanted to ask... Um, I have to get to this question. I know you probably get it a million times. It was the, I think it's the criticism that Noam Chomsky made of you. He said uh, this primitivism would cause mass die-offs. It would lead to euthanasia and people living till they're only 30. How do you respond to that type of um, criticism? Because it's the most common one. And if I don't ask it, someone's going to say, oh, why didn't JG oh, sure. ask? Yeah, I understand. Well, I don't know how Chomsky can cling to that, although he's He's such a leftist. He's just wedded to progress with a capital P. You know, he points out, well, there's 7 billion people. They're all going to starve. Well, first of all, why are there 7 billion people? What caused that unnatural uh, growth of population? I would call it unnatural. It was very stable before domestication. So, you know, he's just, I think his point of view is the suicidal one. The, the mass die-off is happening right now. You know, I mean... In, in a way, not. I mean, we're comfortable, for example, you and I, uh, I, I assume, you know, you don't have a problem with what to eat uh, this evening or something. But overall, uh, it's it's just amazing. It's just, I think it's scandalous the, the way he's, and you know, by the way, he, he's not only argued, and he said some choice comments about me behind my back to other people, but we're not only uh, genocidal in our thinking, we're genocidalists. In other words, we want the die-off. We're trying to kill everybody off. I mean, that's just crazy talk. What is he talking about? We're well, trying to figure a way to where we can survive, how we can transition in another direction. 
I feel like it, it sort of is. Um, what was that? Sorry. Well, he wants us to keep going over the cliff and wipe out everything, wipe out all the indigenous people that are left and every other thing of value. I wanted you know, to get into that um, r real briefly here. Uh, you mentioned he's such a leftist, and I know you have sort of a, I think you have a very interesting critique of the left. You're definitely not a, a communist or anything like that. What is your critique of the left? Because I don't think you're, you're not taking a critique from a sort of like far right position or a right wing position. You're taking a very kind of a liberationist critique of the left. So explain that to my listeners. Well, right, right. I'm certainly not on the right. But when people talk about uh, the left or the, the left has failed or how do we revive the left or so forth, I look at it more, the left hasn't failed. It never tried. It was just fine with everything. It was just fine with industrialism, mass society, domestication, civilization, every part of what we're talking about, what we're trying to question. Uh, so, yeah, I stopped being a leftist quite a long time ago, but I'm from the left. That was my origin. I'm, you know, I'm from the left. I was a radical labor organizer and fully involved in the in the fights of the 60s against the war, against racism. And I'm coming from that for sure. But then you're a fan of Guy Debord, as I as I recall, too, Society of the Spectacle. Yeah, yeah, yeah quite a bit, quite a bit, although he he never really broke with the left. He had criticisms of, of it, but he was he was still mainly a Marxist. And even though he contributed a lot, I would say he he never really broke with that with that thing. Especially like technology. Remember, some of these writings are kind of funny. He, he, he envisioned in one place this utopia where cities would be on wheels and they could go down to the beach. You know, you'd have this lovely. And of course, when you start thinking about it, what would it take to put a, a city on, on wheels? And what is a city? Why is a city? I mean, you start questioning these things and, you know, it kind of evaporates as, as, a, as a possibility. So what was the, I think this is an interesting question, and I, I don't know if you've been asked it before, but what was the breaking point for you where you started even questioning uh, the sort of left Marxist critiques of things and said, we have to go further and, you know, sort of formulating this critique of civilization? Well, it was kind of a long road. I mean, I kind of eventually got there, but uh, from my union experience, I was then interested in uh, grad school. Uh, the history of unionism, and what was that all about? And, and you know, the first unions in England, for example, and that rather easily morphed into the question of the factory system, the Industrial Revolution. So then I was off after that quite a bit, and I noticed, in terms of Marx himself, he wanted all everybody to be crowded into the factories. That would make this giant united proletariat, which could overthrow capitalism. Well, it started to occur to me rather easily that that's just a further stage of domestication. They're more powerless when they're more scattered on the land, like the handloom weavers. They had some autonomy. They were riding fairly often. <laughs> but once they were herded into the factories and worked 14 hours a day, there was almost no resistance, frankly, relatively speaking. It wasn't this wonderful, radical transformation, just the opposite. So I started thinking right away, well, you know, that doesn't seem right. That's, that's not the way to go. And, and so from then on, implicitly, I wasn't part of the left uh, anymore. But I mean, I didn't talk about it all that much. But, you know, that was kind of a turn there. The whole question of industrialism in itself, even before you might get to the question of domestication, obviously much earlier on. But uh, it's kind of, uh, to me, it's kind of clear that that was not a good move. That was not a good move. He was wrong about that. So what ways do you think we have of escaping this sort of domestication that, you know, we've been sort of ensconced in now? For people that aren't familiar, I mean, there's terms like rewilding. What would these things mean to people if you were trying to introduce this thought to them? Well, there are efforts. I'm not saying uh, we're going to succeed. I mean, who knows? It's uh, it's a mammoth undertaking, but at least to begin to question all these things. The, you know, there are practical projects going on, like Rewild Portland, uh, or lots of various people on the land scattered around, and they have these earth skills workshops on a regular basis. 
all over the place. They're, they're not much in the news, but they're there and people are thinking along those lines of how could we survive post-civilization? Are we equipped at all to do that? Because we've been so de-skilled by the whole process of civilization. How, how ready would we be? You know, the, not only the questioning of it, but the, you know, the, the real uh, practical part of it is, has been taken up by some people. And I think there, there's more attention to it. I hope there's going to be a lot of attention to it. It's, it's kind of the logical next step, so, or, or part of it. You know. So j just to be clear, if I have listeners that are unfamiliar with the term rewilding, are, are we talking about going back uh, to maybe a hunter sort of gatherer way of life? Well, that's the way I see it. I mean, rewilding, I would also call it uh, de-domestication or decolonization. These things are tied together. It seems to me it's that maybe puts a little more flesh on the bones there. That's what we're talking about. That process involves these things of undoing the uh, the captivity of it all, the uh, you know the trampling of these ways of life, and learning from these ways of life, from the indigenous experience and, and even the Paleolithic experience. Uh, going back to hunter gatherer stuff, what we what we learned. And by the way, let me just say. You know, in the 1980s, that was a further step for me, quite by accident. I ran across, I was more of a Frankfurt School uh, in social theory, that kind of stuff. And Adorno just, and I, stuff like I, that, right? What's that? I said Adorno and, and Marcuse. Right, and exactly, stuff like that. exactly. Very, very influenced by the, those, those people. Well, and I just discovered the anthropology just by accident. You know, Marshall Solins, uh, Richard B. Lee. Uh, Stanley Diamond, just a host of people. I had no idea, I'd never taken any anthropology courses in college or anything like that. It never even entered my consciousness at all. And that was just a mind blower. When you, If you can learn that, how was it back then? It wasn't just people were just too ignorant to devise all this uh, civilization. No, it was an utterly different story. It just blew my mind. I, I started looking at things uh, more deeply, I would say. So what stood out to you most when you first began looking at the anthropological uh, history? Well, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of stereotypes, uh, even now, there certainly are, you know, you got the caveman dragging the woman into the cave, and, you know, the brutality, the stupidity of it. it, it just, just a completely crazy comic book picture which turns not, out not to be true, including the one about everybody was dead by 20 or 30. That's simply not true. That's not true. There, there was a fairly high infant mortality rate, which could, I would say, skew the numbers. Uh, but if you survived in infancy, you live as long as we do, pretty much. You know, that's a generalization. But So in other words, a lot of these things we, I sort of took for granted in the background of my mind. If I thought about it at all, I would have these same sort of uh, cliches that, you know, turned out to be false. Who would want to go back then? We, we were all, we never, uh, you know, I mean, we were just not equipped. Well, actually, if you like no hierarchy, if you like face-to-face -face community, if you like all these good things, that's when we had it. And then we lost it completely. There, there you go. It's, it, <laughs> you know, to put it kind of uh, in stark terms, it's, you know, kind of boils down to that. So what's interesting to me is uh, with your critique of technology, and I think we need more of a critique of technology than ever before. I think we live in, you know, I, I always tell people, I feel like we're living in something that even Jeremy Bentham couldn't have imagined with his panopticon. It's even bigger than that. I mean, we have this Pegasus spyware scandal. We have the NSA. Uh, but when we say technology, what do you mean by technology, because that can mean many things, like a, a spear for hunting could be technology, for instance. Well, I think it's useful to go back the step before domestication uh, and look at division of labor. That's where it starts get, setting up the move to domestication, it's, it's, it seems to me. And that's the distinction one could make between tools and technology, uh, a system of, of technology versus uh, that which anyone could use, where you have a kind of intimacy and flexibility, for example, with a spear or with a stone tool or, you know, 
anything like that. And they didn't, didn't happen to be stone tools. It's just that they survived much longer than what, what people made out of wood or, or cordage or bone or whatever. But uh, if you start getting these gradations, if you start getting these specializations where there's a distance between somebody who has the skills, they, they begin to have an effective power over other people. And especially as the thing gets a little more sophisticated, then you start getting, uh, you know, you move away from the uh, egalitarian uh, part of it. And then you, I, I've often thought that probably the shaman was the first specialist in, the, in that sense of having power over others. Not, not necessarily using it for evil purposes. The shaman, we, we might assume, operated in good faith, didn't want to exercise power over others, but it, it's, it was inherent. You know, if you have the power of life and death over people, you know, that's, uh, that's authority. So then you're on the road already, it seems to, uh, seems to me, to uh, start getting hierarchy. And uh, I think that sets the stage for the jump off to domestication, which is really a, a, a hugely qualitative change. I'm glad you brought up the shaman bit because, uh, you know, I when I was younger, I went through one of those, you know, uh, phases where I was into the hippies and whatnot and Terrence McKenna. And I, I had a uh, sociology teacher pull me aside and say, you know, the shamanism, you know, shamans were actually like a priest class. Like it's it's very hierarchical. It led to domination. <laughs> right. So in regards to where we're at, right now i mean we're in a stage i think of civilization where it's different than it was maybe in in prior points it's global now so this may be the final stage so to speak i mean at least i think from your perspective and a lot of other people's perspective yeah it would seem so it's uh and everything seems to be speeded up and you know we're, we're at such a disadvantage right now i mean i think just vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic, it's hard to communicate. It's hard to have uh, uh, friendships and so forth that, that don't suffer under the strain of it all. And not just the pandemic. I mean, this was, it was headed this way even before, uh, what, a year and a half ago when, when this, this COVID thing broke out, but already really tough on people. Like, you know, I was referring before to uh, the amount of, uh, uh, despair and uh, depression and anxiety. You can see it so clearly among the kids that just, just horrifying. You know, that's that's coming on pretty fast. I mean, the, the number of people who have no friends, the number of people who feel like nobody knows them, the, the isolation of it all, the loneliness of it all. And and it's it's happening, of course, more in the developed countries. You know, there's a minister of loneliness now in the UK, a cabinet position. Because it's not something that you, it's just sort of an odd thing. It doesn't matter much. No, it's pivotal to society. What is social existence right now? What's left of it? What, you know, where where are we at? It's I feel like a crisis. I feel like that gets into one of your um, biggest issues that you talk about a lot, and I, I sometimes think people um, don't focus on this aspect of your work enough. But I think. A great amount of your work, in addition to critiquing civilization, to critiquing technology, the the sort of techno-industrial mega machine that we live in, I think you're questioning the, you know, age, the zeitgeist, so to speak, of nihilism and the question of how do we find meaning in a nihilistic age? Could you talk a little bit to that for my audience? Well, it's just as necessary as it is scarce. I mean, uh, I think of... Uh... Michel Hulebeck, the uh, French novelist, um, boy, he, he, he's kind of a nasty character, apparently, but boy, he nails it. This, uh, I think it's the newest book or maybe second to the top of the, 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 the novel submission. And if I could just go off on that for a sec. It's a, he's talking about France uh, headed into a, a national election. And the right figures, everything's coming apart, just like it is, <laughs> even more so, what, two, three years later down the road. But so they're casting about for who is going to take power 
and provide some kind of answer. The right, the Le Pen types and everything, they figure it's their turn to play. They've been waiting forever. And the general humanistic left and so forth center hasn't got nothing to offer. And it's pretty obvious. Well, what happens is France elects uh, a Muslim government. It's kind of, it's a shocking story, but he, he, he draws it out quite well. This is what you're going to have to have to run society, to hold it together. You may not like what's going to happen to women, for example, under a, a Islamist regime, but wow, this is where we're at. It's, it's, and, you know, and all of his protagonists are one step away from suicide. They realize there is no more juice to civilization, no more life, no more energy. We're getting to the end of the ball game. And so he, he, re, he gives us a scenario that that's not so crazy to imagine France electing uh, that kind of regime. Well, it, what's what's so weird about Welbeck in that book submission is, I mean, I, I think he's he does not have a, a positive view of Islam, right? But he, I mean, he ultimately comes to this conclusion of, you know, maybe we'd be better off with Islamism because this is also terrible and meaningless. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. You you've read it. You know. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at. Uh, it's not. He's not endorsing. Uh, Islamic uh, stuff uh, necessarily. He's just reporting, basically, and his own life is in tatters too. So he's he's left with the question: Well, you can stay on, but you'll have to take this pledge to the Islamic government and everything. And he kind of, as I recall, he kind of says, "Well, what have I got to lose? I'm my life is a mess. I'm not getting off anymore with drugs and sex and everything else. It's just I'm pretty close to the very end. I don't believe in what I'm doing as an academic and." You know, in other words, everything is gone. So, you know, why not? So then, I guess, how, I mean, I think we both uh, are, are part of this sort of um, civilization. We, we're both domesticated. The people listening are, are domesticated. How, how do we find meaning in an age that is increasingly nihilistic? Well, that's the, a big not, question, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I, it seems to me that. that you know, the situation is uh, distinguished between passive nihilism and active nihilism. And I think that's useful. You can be passive and just go, you know, fuck it. Just, it's all, you know, I'm not, I can't do anything. And people are stupid if they think they can do anything. I've been charged with that a lot. Anyone who has any chance, holds out a hope of anything is, is a dope. You know, that, that kind of stuff, I think, is just surrender and it, it doesn't help at all. But then there are the active nihilists, and I think that still is a useful uh, thing. You get to, um, <clears throat> you, you lose all faith in the dominant stuff, and then you, then you know what to do about it. Tear it down. Get rid of it. And so then you're, you're active. I mean, I think the word nihilism kind of isn't maybe used quite so properly in that context, but it's clear what they're talking about. You can be an active, you can be uh, a participant, you know, you can be a fighter. You can do something about it in any way you can with whatever it is you do with, you know, writing or uh, any, any effort you have. You can do it in light of what needs to be done, what needs to be put an end to. And uh, that takes lots of different forms. And um, I think people are more receptive to you know, seeing, seeing things in a different light and, and possibly, uh, you know, doing something about it instead of just sailing off the cliff with everything else. And uh, I mean, for one thing, it, like I said, everybody wants community, okay? You can start with that in terms of a conversation. Everybody wonders if they have kids or grandkids, what's it going to be like for them? Even one year from now, not to mention 10 years from now, it's just going to be catastrophic. As if it isn't already. Well, we've so seen can... a not not to interrupt you, but we've seen I think a rise um, in talk about uh, things like antinatalism. I know a lot of young women now. I live uh, in a university town. Uh, people don't want to have children because they're thinking climate crisis. You know, I don't want my kids to live through that. So I, I think we're definitely seeing that. Yeah, <clears throat> and apparently we're seeing something that uh, who knows if it pans out to be much. But now, well, we once thought. <laughs> Just a few days ago, we, we once thought there's a respite to the COVID thing. 
and people go back to work, we get back to normal, everything will be fine. Well, it's surprising how many people not only don't want to go back to work, but are ending up quitting their jobs just when they could resume their jobs. Kind of, and this thing in China, I think this is related, this uh, lying flat phenomenon, have you run into that? No, no, tell me a little bit more. Well, it started as a poster uh, of this guy lying in bed. Uh, A real dropout thing, it kind of made me think of the 60s. Lying flat is uh, kind of a watchword now. Uh, It's caught on in social media quite a lot in China. It, It just means dropping out. Don't go to work. Why waste your time doing that? Have a nice day in bed. Screw it. And, you know, hardworking Chinese, the stereotype, I don't know much about China, I grant you, but uh, wow, talk about a scandalous thing to say, much less raging popularity with this. And the government is very scared of this. And and this is just unfolding now. I think it only came out about a week ago or something. I I don't know where it'll go. I was going to say in Japan, I mean, we have all these incidents of uh, people dying from just exhaustion because they're working so much. Well, and also in Japan, this hikikomori thing of people, the young people retiring to their rooms <laughs> and not coming out for decades, if at all. I mean, this is, it's related to this lying flat thing. So you've got the passive resistance to the whole work machine, which is what civilization is, in some places worse than other places, of course. So, you know, it's not all uh, uh, untroubled sleep for the system. There's There's people who... Ain't happy at all. So there are, do you think there are pockets of resistance at least left? Oh, definitely. And they may be or may not be uh, open to, uh, you know, thinking it through more deeply in terms of what might be needed. And maybe they won't get to that point or maybe they'll just find a new way to go to think about it. That's possible. You know, it's it's not like we're not saying we have all the answers, but uh In other words, there's a radical potential to things like that, it seems to me, where people are so turned off with what they're given, what they're supposed to be doing. You know, that is not good for the system (laughs) when you get that. Are you ever surprised? I mean, in the past week, we've had all this talk about these. The billionaires want to go to space now. Jeff Bezos wants to go to space. Elon Musk wants to go to space. Uh, You know, I know people like Michio Kaku think we're going to colonize you know, Mars or something, all these Star Trek fantasies. I don't even think humans were made um, to survive in space. Do you think these people actually believe it? Or are they in the grip of, are they like in the grip of some techno madness? What is happening here? Well, maybe they are like the transhumanists. Uh, yeah, we already know from, from the astronauts how bad it is on your health. It's not just that you lose muscle uh, sustenance, uh, but all these other things real serious things and lasting things, not to mention the radiation from being in space and uh, a few other things. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it gets back to these basic things again, once, once I, I'm fond of thinking of the uh, way back that famous earth first poster, looking at the work from the, from the moon, the photo of the earth, you know, the nice fragile earth floating in space and, blah, blah, you know, a a very uh, iconic deal. You could ask, what does it take to have that photo? What do you have to get? What do you have to do? What is the massive industrial thing that gives you a chance to take that photo? And that's, of course, and the Bezos types, they'll dodge that question by saying, well, yeah, the industrial stuff, that's pretty ugly and toxic, but uh, we can get off into space because they want to reproduce it in space. They have to, otherwise you don't have any of the technology. It all depends on mining and so forth. I mean, that's just obvious. So wherever you wherever you take it, you've got to play the you've got to pay the piper sometime. I mean, it's that, it takes only a second to see. The, there's no foundation for that. Is that where that sort of line I brought up earlier that I think you've said before? Uh, you know, civilization as a parasite that always consumes its host. It's it's the endless. It's an endless growth system essentially yeah joseph tainer in his great book uh the the collapse of uh complex societies he he didn't use that phrase i don't think but i got that from that book that uh that's what happens you go past your carrying capacity end of game game over civilization is over you you just 
you've eaten it all up and uh, there you go and case closed he so says what do you, you see it over and over again what do you think we're facing now that i mean this is global now i mean there are very there are very few indigenous uh pockets of resistance left i think in a lot of ways we have gone global i mean we were just talking about the the exhaustion in china the exhaustion in japan the exhaustion in america the the strife in france the strife in america it's everywhere it's it's global and we're facing a climate crisis so where do you think things are headed in the long run and in a way i i sometimes wonder if we're just going to be forced into living lives that are not you know so techno uh, induced anymore, like just in order for us to survive. Well, I do think so. I think it's, uh, I've, I've put it this way before that if the future isn't somehow primitive, there won't be a future. It gets back to things like simplicity and how to undo the, the complexity, the increasing, always increasing complexity, always increasing speed. I think it was two days ago, I was reading about, uh, the Japanese have come up with a, a way to double the speed from microchips to make the internet connection happen twice as fast. It wasn't not just a new record, but, and what that translates is you've got to work faster. That's, that's the bottom line there. You know, that's, you know, the keystrokes that are counted and everything else. It's just, uh, it keeps on going that way. And, and a reminder that civilization is always more work. It, you know, it should be, Gosh, isn't the technology going to liberate us? We won't have to do all this. Do the machines will do it all? Huh? Let's let's check that out. <laughs> that turns out, turns out to be monstrously false. It's completely crazy. That's another interesting aspect of your work. I know you you talked about how it, it's funny because we work more, but we're also more sedentary. Um, and I think part of what you and other thinkers, um, I know Bob Black has talked about the anti-work stuff as well. What's interesting is I think there were previous eras that we lived in where there was more time for play, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of pleasurable community experience. Could you talk a little bit about that aspect of your work and, and your interest in that? Well, that's another progression that we can chart. You know, the uh, I was reading a piece the other day about music. We've gone from creating, playing music with each other to uh, listening to music at concerts and so forth to listening in isolation with the headphones to the music. I mean, that's that seems like not the healthiest uh, projection or, or direction that this has gone in, but, uh, and it's an obvious one. That's just, of course, that's the way it goes. Less and less uh, human connection gone from, well, now texting, for example. You, you can't even, uh, the human voice is kind of chased away, right? I don't text, I'm not gonna text, I don't care. That's just another fucking uh, estrangement that I'm not going to do that. I guess but, what I was... Know, that, to me, that's just, just well, the whole social media, too. I mean, it's... It's anti-social media. That's what I call it sometimes. <laughs> there you go. Precisely. That's a good way to put it. Or the billboard way of, of communicating instead of anybody, if they want to, if they should want to contact me, I'm, I'm wide open. I'm, I'm, I answer communications you know of course i'm happy to do it and but i don't need to put up a billboard about uh and then uh, anyway that's <laughs> well I, I i guess what i was trying to get at john was um we're in this weird situation where we work more but we're also more sedentary and we have less leisure time than ever yeah it's just wacko i was noticing these ads now there's a bunch of them on tv ads where you can you stay on your couch just sit on your ass and buy a car. You don't have to go anywhere and they'll deliver the car to you. I mean, that just seems like, I mean, I'm not in favor of cars, <laughs> by the way, but yeah, there's several of these outfits. It just uh, imagine that. You, you don't even have to get off your butt to, to get a car. And, and it, of course it's projected as the height of adventure to drive a car, like another, you know, sedentary inert thing to do. The, the, Diabe diabetic uh, quotient goes up and up as people get fatter and you know more sedentary, as you point out. I mean, it's all just so damn unhealthy. One thing I wanted to get into, and I, I know you don't cover this in the book. There were just two more things I wanted to cover. Um, the first was I wanted to get your thoughts on 
you know, issues related to um, things like medical technology, because I know it's it's interesting. You have spoken out um, for people that are uh, trans, um, you know, uh, I forget who it was you had this argument with. Uh, the, he wrote the book Endgame, and I think he was going after all these trans people. Uh, but, but how do you square that? Like, yeah, yeah, how yeah, can yeah. trans people exist without these sort of medical technologies? Well, there's, there's a, I think, a spectrum there. I'm not totally expert in that area. But, uh, yeah, the, the hate speech about uh, the anti-trans thing, the turf thing, lyric keys, all that. It's not only ugly, in my opinion, but it puts lives at stake. And, you know, it it, it exists in, in, it's the same as Trump. The Trump heads have exactly the same position. Don't let them uh, use the bathroom. Don't let them uh, play sports or, or whatever it is. You know, it, it's just as ugly as, as for these uh, right-wing populists. And they claim to be radical feminists. They're reactionary. It's just, it's hate speech, in my opinion. And how people make that transition, uh, you know, progress in their lives. They want to be who they feel they are. And I feel like let them be who they are. If they feel like they're more female uh, than or more male, what do you, why, why not uh, support that? I mean, I mean, it involves various choices. I mean, in, including a lot of things, you know, even, even up to and including surgery for some people. And uh, drugs for other people, and I mean, I don't even know what, but all the, how many people are doing what with that. I I know people have gone through it, and are really feeling much happier in their lives than they were before. Don't need to be attacked by by creeps like uh, Derek Jensen. He's gotten more. Just that's really ugly. He's he's gotten up the deep end, and he's he's enthralled to Lear Keith apparently. It's really so ugly. I. I guess what I was asking is, I, I mean, if I think when people hear primitivism, they're thinking, does that mean that John and, and Kevin and some of these other thinkers are saying we shouldn't have surgeries, we shouldn't have drugs? I mean, uh, w what would you say to that? Well, I mean, you know, I hope we'll get to that place. Uh, but, you know, we're all part of it now. We're all part of it now. I had to I had the choice of prostate surgery or not. I could have said no. This is a high tech thing, and uh, no, thank you. I'd be dead right now if I if I made that choice. Um, and actually, a further choice was radiation therapy. Uh, I said yes to that. I could have been ideological. No, I don't believe in that. Uh, or or in the case with the vaccines, there are people yapping about the vaccines that it's a, somehow a nightmare. They don't seem to care about life. It seems to me anyway. You know, we're all held hostage to all this stuff right now. And, it, you know, you can't take, I don't think you can take this position like if we're in a vacuum and we're not pretty much equally uh, held captive to it. This is, this is, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I, I'm sure you always get that question from the hecklers that will say, well, you're a primitivist, but you're using technology right now. You're on a Zoom call. And it's like, well, how else are we supposed to? We're sort of forced into communicating this way. Well, I think so. I mean, it's you can say it's uh, compromised. It certainly is. But I remember being on Art Bell years ago. I did the whole three hours with him, and he kept saying during the during the time on the late night radio, he kept saying, uh, "You should live in a cave. If you were true to your ideas, you live in a cave. Why don't you live in a cave?" He kept on and on with that, and I said, like what you just implied there or uh, spoke to, I don't think I could try to contribute if I was sitting in a cave somewhere. Plus, can you point me to caves where uh, <laughs> they would be available to me? Uh, you know, just, it's kind of a silly uh, point of view. It's, but you know, the, this whole question of ableness, uh, I, I was, I've been attacked on that before. I remember once in Montreal, this person there got up and just started shrieking at me. And uh, you can say, we need to get rid of all this stuff, but you're this able-bodied male and so on and so forth. And I was really not very, uh, I hadn't thought about it very much and I, I should have already been thinking about this kind of stuff, but, and, and the only, this is, I'm making kind of a lame joke about this, but what I, what I came up with at the spur of the moment was, I'm pretty old. 
I may be in a position that I'm going to need some help too. <laughs> you know, don't don't make me out to be uh, some you know absolutely unsinkable person. You know, and anyway, it's th that question is there and it should be there. What about these people who need assistance? But you know, what, another if I could just add something on that, it doesn't necessarily require keeping the worldwide grid forever until there's nothing left of any human life or other, other life for that matter. I mean, there's simpler solutions. For example, these respirators, you know, you can, you can create electricity on a bicycle. You know, that's how, that's how your light works on a, on a bike. You can pump electricity. Uh, that could be a stopgap uh, thing, you know, just one example of something like that it's without, uh, without having the entire world uh, suck dry for the for the needs of all this power. So it's it sounds like you're saying it, it goes back to, uh, you know, w when we're talking about technology, we can be talking about, you know, uh, forms of technology that are, are useful and important. But then I think your critique is more this sort of total networked technology where everything is being mined and everything's constantly on the grid. Well, that's right. So, uh, you know, I think we're just talking about a direction uh, to try to go in. And while uh, if you can see what undermines all of this, what is required for it to keep going, then then you kind of start at that level. I mean, if you and different people, certainly including people on the left, they want to keep all this stuff. They want to keep all this stuff. And as I'm fond of uh, thinking of a, a friend of mine in Detroit would always pose the question, oh, does that mean you'd like to go down in the mine? And the and the person would go, well, uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? And and Peter, this, this friend of mine, would say, I ain't gonna go down in the mine unless you put a gun up to my head. Okay, so who's gonna go down the mine? You wanna have all these millions of people doing the extracting, the milling, the smelting, the warehousing, all these horrible jobs, but you would never think of doing it yourself, right? Isn't that right? And then they're kind of stumped. You want all this stuff by magic. Well, it's not magic. It's it's destructive on every level you can think of. I a lot of my listeners come from that sort of um, left world. I used to work at um, Zero Books. So, what what would you say to? Uh, there's probably someone reacting to this conversation when they hear it, and they're they're probably shrieking about something. What would you say to the people that aren't sold on maybe how you think about things? What would you say to the left? Is what I'm getting at. Well, why do you cling to this suicidal deal? I mean, it, what's uh, how has it worked out? What is what is the progression here? Isn't it kind of obvious? Is it, is it possible to evade uh, what's going on and and how it works? It doesn't seem to me it is. And uh, there's there's no way to green this thing. If that's what you want, well, we can salvage it. We can just make it nicer or. Quote, carbon capture technology, I think, is what they talk about a lot. Yeah, right. That, that's a good one. Well, um, now there are books that just shred that. There's some very good ones, you know, that just take that apart. Uh, that sounds good. Alternative technology. That sounds good. Sure. Okay. Let's let's take a look at that. That that might be good. You know, who, I'm not. You can't just throw stuff out out of some you know idea or position you have. Everything should be examined and questioned, and including that, and including, of course, primitivism. But so, you can unmask it pretty easily, I think. Right, right. So the the last thing I wanted to touch upon was uh, there's a section in your new book, uh, philosophy and anti philosophy. Um, maybe you could just sum up what, what what is your interest in that topic, and what do we mean by philosophy and anti philosophy? What is that dealing with that chapter or section? I'm not so sure it was <laughs> totally successful. I, I think it was partly trying to uh, say why I, I'm not a philosopher and why philosophy so far hasn't really gotten us anywhere. Uh, it's It was a very short piece. and uh, But I was trying to, it, it doesn't mean, and people have said to me, well, that doesn't mean that all philosophy, including yours, or <laughs> thinking in general, you can dispatch with it, and they're right. I mean, that's that's not what I would uh, be in favor of. So I, I don't know. It's just that there's kind of a that's a very valorized uh, label uh, 
philosopher and you know i think of wittgenstein he he thought it was mostly a joke a bunch of false questions false positions that didn't amount to anything they, they weren't real problems at all mm -hmm. in a way philosophy can be more about i think uh you know games we play in our head rather than viewing the world in a very empirical way and dealing with the realities as we can observe and see them well yeah and and you know it's it's a question of what is communication i mean is this possible it's possible to imagine a more a better way than symbolic language as as david abram brought out in uh, the spell of the sensuous he's talking about alphabetic thinking and how this starts to be built up and takes us away from a more direct intimate connection with life, various forms of life. And uh, there's a lot to that book. I just uh, want to, if you could, maybe you could explain that. And I, I will start wrapping up in a minute or two here. But um, one of your, you, you sort of critique every sacred cow imaginable. You've critiqued uh, concepts of time, mathematics, uh, and symbolic language. What are, what's at the root of those critiques? Like, what do we mean when we're critiquing language? Well, you know that piece uh, from back in the 80s uh, about the origins and meaning of language, I gotta admit that's probably the most speculative one. The others are more grounded. They're definitely more grounded. I'm not renouncing it, but it's speculation. You know, it's it, it gets onto the question of what is representation? What is symbolic thinking? And a review of my new book, uh, who was the person who did that? Uh, it was at the uh, Anarchist Review of Books, which I don't think is out yet, number two. The conclusion was, Zerzan is explicitly against thinking. Uh, I just threw up my arms. Like, did, did you, we, are you talking about the same book that, that I think we're referring to? In other words, that's not it at all. I mean, but if you have only one conception of thinking, that it has to be this kind of symbolic thinking, which really hasn't gotten us very far, uh, as opposed to maybe a different kind that we had for a long time, even including, this sounds kind of crazy, but uh, a much more, not only intuitive, but uh, how, did, how did Freud put it? He said we were probably much more, uh, oh, what's the word, psychic, I guess is just the closest word. Uh, and he didn't feel that was so wonderful, but he copped to it. So maybe we had those capacities, which we've almost entirely lost because they've been supplanted by symbolic culture, symbolic language. It's it's interesting you bring up Freud too, because I, I feel like he dovetails with you in ways, even though he's pro-civilization, because he sort of says civilization causes neuroses. <laughs> exactly. Oh, civilization and its discontents. Amazingly radical text. He, he had it all down there. He really did. Only to conclude, but, you know, well, but, of course, we can't get rid of civilization. So we got to live with the, the fact that civilization is a, is a machine for creating unhappiness, neurosis, as you just said. The the thing that gets me with the, the language question is uh, we have a lot of abstract language, you know, just human language in general. I sometimes wonder if the way it's developed is to make, this is going to sound crazy maybe, but it makes deception a lot easier in a lot of ways. It seems like it can get very manipulative, uh, human language. Well, you know, that's one of those, uh, I think they decided sometime in the 19th century to ban the question of the origin of language. There were all these theories batted around. It was kind of interesting to look at that. And one of them, one theory was, it, it was invented in order to lie. Th that was the theory that was put forth. <laughs> that's why we have language. And, there were a bunch of competing theories, but they didn't get anywhere. I mean, there, there was no consensus is what I'm saying. So so last question here, and I, I don't know if you picked the title of the book or uh, if it was someone at Feral House, but why the title When We Are Human? Well, I guess it was from uh, a small piece that was more anthropology, archaeology, uh, When We Were Human. And it was one of my uh, efforts to show that we had all these capacities and skills and gifts way before domestication, you know, almost incomparably, incomparably far back, uh, which has always kind of blown me away. So then it just seemed like, well, you could just change it to make it a little more uh, uh, current. Uh, 
you know, or, or a quest, you know, when are we human? When do we get to be human? So, but it really came from that other piece called uh, when we were human. So I, I guess in closing for you, um, and I, I almost feel this way myself at times, but it, it seems like we've gotten farther and farther away from what it means to be human. I mean, I, when I was young, people used to use the term social animal a lot. We're social animals. I never hear that anymore. Uh, it, it seems like we've gotten really far away from thinking ourselves as, as social and cooperative and, you know, like no one thinks about mutual aid anymore. And, you know, to me, that's like part of who we are as human beings. We want to help each other and communicate and socialize. But I don't hear anyone use those terms anymore. Well, they've become pretty hollow, haven't they? I mean, you might hear politicians or developers use the word community, for example. But, you know, again, uh, whatever happened to that, it's just it really has been shredded and supplanted by mass society. And uh, But I think it, it makes it easier to see that if there's any silver lining. Isn't that more starkly obvious now? It's not. Uh, in other words, you know, a lot of this stuff we could, you know, totally agree. We're talking about stuff that uh, not that many people agree with. But if you put it the other way around in terms of what people defend, are there defenses for the other, the dominant stuff? I don't think there are. It's just the system has no answers. It's just really threadbare. It's not. And, and you can't you can't find people. They will readily. Well, you know, maybe not totally agree, but kind of readily cop to, yeah, that's the reality. Yeah, everybody I, knows that. I had a friend who was a big fan of your work when I was in college, and he eventually said to me, I agree with everything Zerzon says, but I, I like my air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, right. I mean, that fits us too. We're all domesticated. I mean, here we are in this worsening situation, and, you know, what, what choice do you have? Just to end and, on a positive... Yeah. Go on. Well, I was just going to say, but that doesn't, you know, close out other possibilities of of uh, thinking, you know, thinking about going in another direction, trying to do that, trying to go in that direction. Just in closing, I wanted to come back to what I said at the very beginning of the show. I said, I feel like your work, whether people agree or disagree with it, I think at the heart of what you are doing, you are trying to find answers for how can we become truly liberated? Um, what does liberation mean to you, and what is the role of that in your writing and your thought? Um, well, this is this is not the postmodern point of view, but I, I think I agree with Rousseau that people are basically fine until they are corrupted by these institutions. That's an essentialist point of view, and of course we we've we've mocked that pretty well. But um, I mean, I think that's to be an anarchist. I think that's kind of what you pin it on. You know, if you take away all the shit, uh, all the oppression and ways to deform people and reduce them, they're okay. We're all right. We can, we can, uh, we could be able to live and, and do things in that kind of a world. And that connection, as we've been talking about, is so lost now that it becomes the issue. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to, uh, to be liberated but that sense what is what does that word mean i i just wanted to add to that really quickly i think what you just said about you know people are basically good i think that's what sets you apart i i know there's probably someone that has said uh oh anarcho-primitivism is is conservative or it's reactionary but i think you know if you have the view humans are basically good you know i don't think you can be a, a conservative or a reactionary to be honest Right, right. Yeah, that doesn't work, does it? No, that's they're the people that believe in original sin, that people are, are basically horrible. That's why you need all these laws and surveillance and everything else. So I want to let you get going, John. I know we went a little bit over time, and I really appreciate that. I think you've done a lot of great writing over the years, and I, I hope everyone will read it. Um, I hope people read the new book, When We Are Human. Um, anything else you just want to say to my listeners in closing, um, in case, you know, uh, they're just becoming familiar with your work through this show, anything you want to throw out there? Oh, I don't know. It's, uh, I just want to tell you, JG, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you. 
Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with John Zerzan. And be sure to check out his book, When We Are Human, Notes from the Age of Pandemics, available now from Feral House, a publisher I highly recommend that you support. As always, if you can, please, please, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. There's a $1, $5, $10, $15, and $100 tier. I would really, really appreciate your support because you are what keeps this show going. And at the $10 and $15 tiers, of course, you get a producer's credit shout-out. So, producer's credit shout-outs to... Mark, Arlen, Spartacus, Gunner, Ed, Gratz, James, Mickey, Brian, The Warner, The 42 Group, Nick, Emilia, Chase, Chris, Ork, Black Tuna, Catherine, Nathan, David, Holland, Martin, Stu, and Jeffrey. If you'd like your very own producer's credit on each and every edition of Parallax Views, consider joining those listeners in supporting me at the $10 or $15 tiers of my Patreon page. It is you, the listener, that helps to keep this show going. And I must say, I deeply appreciate your help in keeping Parallax Views alive. And with that being said... Until next time, you've been listening to Parallax Views with J. Parallax Michael. Views to Parallax with Views Michael. with J. Michael. The way out is not simply to say, don't do it, just to prohibit it. If nothing else, if we don't do it, others will be doing this like crazy. So, you know, we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm, I know of the great anxiety problems, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff, it's a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight. With no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.